At that time, Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter, and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. And going on from thence, he saw other two brethren, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother in a ship with Zebedee their father, mending their nets, and he called them. And they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness, and all manner of disease among the people. And there followed him great multitudes of the people from Galilee, and from the capitals of Judea, and Jerusalem, and from beyond Jordan. <coughs> and seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and he was set. His disciples came unto him, he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Native American Alaskan Aleuts to Russian hierarchs, first hierarchs of the Russian church, and everything in between. That we consider the great passage of scripture today, where in our epistle in the book of Romans, the Lord makes a simple statement that there's no respect of persons with God. Respect of persons is a terrible thing. As we saw last week, it can impede our confession of Christ. It's a damning cowardice based on valuing men too highly in the wrong reason, for the wrong reasons. Today's readings draw into this issue of respecting persons from another angle. Do we truly understand that God does not respect the outward station of man or woman, nor does he account any reward whatsoever to anyone for any other quality? other than that of his or her spiritual work done in righteousness and in faith. Truly, we need to get God's perspective on the issue of respect for persons. And so we see in our epistle today the doctrine behind God's acceptance of men. It is simply this. Glory, honor, and peace goes to every man, he says, that worketh good to the Jew first, and also to the Gentile. God's standard is that he looks and sees what truly is. God sees reality. God doesn't see the outward facade. God doesn't see what we do with the wrong motives. God sees everything. And his judgment is based on this knowledge of all the works of men, all the thoughts of men, everything, secret and public. And so, this judgment of God is according to our knowledge and obedience to his voice. To everyone it says, 
who obeys this law of God, there's honor, glory, and peace. And then he says, there's no respect of persons with God. For as many as have sinned, he says, without the law shall also perish without the law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. Then he goes and says, For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law are just before God. There's no respect of persons with God. God has no respect whatsoever for all the things that man values. And I think it's good for us to write the beginning tonight, before we go into this any deeper, to consider this issue of what it means to respect persons. Perhaps we know very well what it means. But I think it's a good time to refresh our memory so that we can test our souls and test our lives. It says here there's no respect of persons with God. God doesn't view what's presented. We present many things. It's called a persona. What we project into the world is not what God sees. God sees what is. God doesn't look at the station of a person. And listen to this list carefully and examine ourselves as we listen to it. God doesn't look at our appearance, our bearing, how noble or not it may be, our personality, our wealth, our reputation, our status, our physical strength, our size, our color, our shape, the sound of what our voice sounds like, our height, our power. None of this is important for God's judgment or for God's treatment. Notice it doesn't say in this passage that God doesn't ever have this issue of disrespect. It says that God doesn't respect persons. That doesn't mean, it doesn't say that God disrespects any person. And so the same list could be applied to people who bear all these qualities, and they're not discriminated against either, or disrespected for having these qualities, certainly. It's not a bad thing to exhibit these qualities. They're good things if they're matched with a heart of obedience. But all these things don't sway God's judgment or treatment negatively if we have them, or positively if we don't. God looks at the inward. God sees not as man sees. Secondly, I think it's good to consider this. That as far as respect of persons are concerned, there's both an inward perspective of respect of persons, wherein we look at ourselves and we apply this list to ourselves, and we don't let our judgment of ourselves be influenced by these outward traits, just as God does it. We need to look at ourselves truly and not coddle or puff up ourselves based on the possession of certain qualities of this list that man sees. Secondly, there's an outward perspective to respect the person, which is the obvious one, that we don't look at others and have our opinion of others tainted by this list of outward qualities. We don't want to have this respect of persons. But I think ultimately there is behind this respecting of persons, this issue. There's no respect of persons with God in an ultimate divine perspective that sees into the soul and that looks at our created nature as beings made in the image and likeness of God. This can be our view also. Are we able to look and take God's mind and God's view of things? If we adopt the divine perspective, we begin to see with spiritual eyes of faith in God's power and hope in God's mercy. And we begin to apply these kind of eyes to what we see in people outwardly. We begin to realize that God's power to heal and transform ourselves and others is great. And so we're not swayed by things that we see outwardly. Rather, we look for what God looks for. Hearing the voice of God and obeying the voice of God and being conformed to the image of Christ, this is the goal. This is what God will judge. And so he says that every man that worketh good will be judged for good and will have glory, honor, and peace. And those that sin will have the opposite. But God has not left us without a voice. And you might say, well, many don't know the gospel. True, they don't. But God has not left us without a voice to guide us in good and to guide us in evil. 
Our conscience, it says, is implanted by God as his voice, teaching us what is good and evil. And by granting every man a conscience, every man an ability to hear the voice of God in his very being, in his soul, his immortal soul, his eternal soul, there's an ability to hear this voice. By this, God has shown that he's given every man an independent will and an ability to do right and to obey the voice of God and to triumph with good over evil and thus obtain the mercy of God. Truly, conscience is a blessed thing. He writes here that conscience bears witness that, and it takes our thoughts and accuses us or excuses us. Very interesting to think about conscience. In Romans chapter 1, it also speaks about conscience and how people defile their conscience to their great detriment. God opens to us a window into his word, into his voice, through our conscience. He speaks to us. He allows us to have like an internal judge, a compass, if you will, that points us away from evil and points us to good. We should listen to this voice. We have this voice. It's a precious thing. The fathers say that when you have your conscience prick you, immediately obey it. And so God points to this fact that judgment that comes to every person is not without a validating voice behind it, which in our lives should be guiding us and teaching us. It says that God will judge the secrets of men, not just what is seen. Someday, the judge will judge us according to truth. And so he will look into the secrets, it says, of our hearts and see what was there. What did we do with the voice of God? Paul says we need to obey the gospel of Christ according to it. He says, my gospel. My gospel means the gospel that I know to be true. It doesn't mean that Paul had some special gospel. Some believe that the gospel of Paul was different than the gospel of Peter. One was according to works for the Jews and one was according to grace for the Gentiles. No, Paul's gospel was the same gospel that Peter preached. It was the same gospel that came from Jesus Christ, that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. But it was a gospel which he knew to be true, which had guided his life, and which was the fulfillment of his faith and hope. And so Paul speaks to us and teaches us that God is no respecter of persons, but he's looking into what is. He's looking at our actions and our deeds done in response to his voice, knowing that every single one of us has an ability to hear that voice through not only the spoken and the preached word of the gospel, but through the actions of our own hearts, our consciences. In our gospel, we see that in the life of our Lord, he illustrates so well this lack of respect for persons in both how he selected his apostles and how he worked among those in the world. We see that Jesus went out to select apostles. And he selected men that were fishermen. They weren't great men of intellect or faith. Perhaps if we looked at our list of qualities, they would fall short of many of them. But God saw in them something which would respond to his word and which would birth faith in them. And so he chose fishermen. He chose Peter and he chose Andrew taken from work, casting their necks into the sea. And he said to them, follow me. And it says straightway, they obeyed him. They left their necks and followed him. This is the hallmark of those who will receive the blessing, the glory, honor, and peace, that when God speaks, we obey. And going on from thence, he saw two more brothers. How beautiful, pairs of brothers working together in the world translated into the kingdom of God to work for the Lord. And so James and Zebedee, John, the sons of Zebedee, there with their father, taking care of their father in his old age, mending their nets in their poverty, were called. Jesus called them. And it says, with them, immediately, they left their ship and their father, and they followed him. They obeyed, too. And for them was laid up glory, honor, and peace, just like with everyone that obeys the gospel. And so Jesus and his selection of those who would follow him, then and now, has no respect of persons. And then Jesus goes out, it says, into all of Galilee. He went into all of Galilee taking the gospel. 
He didn't just go to the synagogues where the holy Jews were. He didn't just go to where the rich men were in the courts. He didn't just go to the business leaders. It says he went to all of Galilee, taking the gospel in full force, attested to by great miracles, by teaching, healing, and preaching. He spread the word of God among the multitudes, validating his message with these great miracles and outward works, and leaving in their hearts his spoken words and the actions of the Holy Spirit behind them to convert people from all manner of diseases, both fleshly and spiritual. Truly, Jesus went out into all the world, and his gospel today has gone out into all the world and is proclaimed to the end of the universe, telling men and women that God is not a respecter of persons, that whosoever will come to him and obey him and be changed by his gospel will be saved. What a beautiful message. What a message that gives us hope if we don't meet the list of men's qualities for salvation. Perhaps when God looks into our hearts, he'll find what is needed. There is no respect of persons with God. The question is, is there with us? Do we have respect of persons? Do we hold back our ministry because of someone's lacking of some of the qualities that we would like to see in them? Do we hold back our ministry because someone can't repay us? The ministry is threefold, and Jesus teaches us what the ministry is. It's teaching, it's preaching, the church does these. It's also helping and healing, as the Lord did. Do we have respect of persons? Do we hold back in any of these three aspects of going forth as God's ministers based on what they look like or what we perceive? Or do we have God's perspective of respect for persons? May God help us to be like him, to extend our love to all, no matter what they might look like, or sound like, or even act like. Can we get beyond the physical, take the divine perspective that's befitting all of us who name the name of Christ? May we go forth, bringing the Holy Gospel as Jesus did, teaching, preaching, living, healing, helping all manner of persons, without respect to persons. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.